Isaiah chapter 55, a uh, remarkable portion from, from here now. We've got chapter 56, chapter 57, uh, that section of scripture, all of it exalting the coming of the Messiah, the, the Lord of glory. And you're going to read and hear more about the millennial age and the, uh, the coming of Christ, the establishment of his kingdom. And for those of you who don't know, maybe you've stumbled in here tonight, I want to remind you that the book of Isaiah that's opened either on your smart device or the Bible in front of you, Isaiah was penned about 740 uh, B.C. That makes that book just under 3,000 years old that's on your lap right now. And the book of Isaiah, the prophet of uh, Isaiah is known as the evangelical prophet. There are more prophecies uttered by the prophet Isaiah that are found in the four Gospels than any other Old Testament book. And in fact, in the epistles written by the apostles, there are more quotes regarding or coming from Isaiah regarding and describing the uh, mission of the Messiah than any other Old Testament book. It is absolutely awesome. And tonight we're looking at a message entitled, Why Wouldn't You Come? It's a question mark on the end. Why wouldn't you come? Is the invitation that we get out of Isaiah chapter 55. The title of the message tonight almost sounds like a conversation that you might have had with some friends or family at maybe holiday time or birthday time. It sounds like the kind of question that someone might ask of you. Maybe, why didn't you come? Why didn't you call us and let us know you weren't coming? Why didn't you let us know? How come you didn't come? We invited you and you didn't show up. There's a sense of brokenheartedness in that question. And God's going to be asking that question tonight here in Isaiah chapter 55 and maybe in your life. He's going to ask you the question, why aren't you coming to me? Why aren't you looking to me as Lord? You might hear someone ask, why didn't you tell us? Whenever you extend an invitation, with that, there's the openness and there's the invite to come, and he's going to invite us. So as we get into this tonight, we'll start uh, at looking at the first point tonight, and we'll just read through it, and may God bless it to our hearts. Look at verses 1 to 3 in Isaiah chapter 55, because why wouldn't you come is the, the question when God has said, come. Notice this in the Bible. God is the one saying, Come, verse 1, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat, yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Look at verse 2, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Listen, friends, this is God speaking. Verse 3, incline your ear and come to me. Here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. God is the one church tonight that is saying, why wouldn't you come when I'm the one in the Bible inviting you to come? Now granted, you know the book, Isaiah is speaking to the people of Israel. God is speaking through his prophet to the, to the chosen people, and he's saying, come, come to me. But what's awesome, Bible students, mark it down in your Bible. This is Isaiah 55, and even the Hebrew scholars understand this. This is not only an invitation by God given to his people. It is a global invitation. This is awesome. This is an invitation that God is giving to all people. Do you have any Jewish blood in you tonight? Any Jewish blood? Raise your hand if you do. Wow, awesome. Listen, if you don't have Jewish blood in you, raise your hand. That's the rest of you, by the way, that didn't raise your hand a moment ago. Listen, Gentiles, where do we get the idea that God would save Gentiles? From the Old Testament. And you're going to hear more of that in a moment, but God's invitation to the Jew is the same as it is to the Gentile. God says, come, listen, tonight, uh, what level of sinner are you? Are you a grand and lofty sinner? Do you know what that means? That means you're a really bad sinner. That doesn't mean you really know how to cover it up. That makes you a really rotten sinner if you know how to cover it up. If you're a bold, grand sinner, you've had a horrible, sinful life, and you know it, and everybody knows it, maybe. Listen, God says, I'm asking you to come. 
He's not saying get out of this church. He's not saying get out of the way. He's not saying you can, you can pack up and get out of my face. God is saying, I want you to come, and I want you to come to me. And notice how he says it. Notice how he puts it when he invites you to come. He says, everyone who thirsts, you've got to be thirsty. God is interested in those who are thirsty. There's people today that spiritually, that's what he's talking about, but they're not thirsty. They have no stomach for the things of God. But notice verse 1, and you judge yourself in light of the Bible. Tonight, he says, everyone who's thirsty. And you ask yourself, am I thirsty? You say, well, Jack, can you explain the thirst that you're talking about? Sure. He's talking about spiritual thirst. If you would be intellectually honest enough to look down, as it were, inside of your heart, inside of your soul, and ask yourself, am I satisfied? Do I have a deep satisfaction with my life? I'm not saying you're sinless. I'm not saying you're perfect. We all struggle. We all battle. But those of us who know Christ, we are satisfied on the inside. We're, listen, we're not satisfied with ourselves, are we? We're satisfied with him, aren't we? It's him. It's all about him. Why do you Christians always talk about Jesus? It's all praise the Lord. Because you know what? We're satisfied. We're satisfied. He has done this. It's supernatural. Inside, there was a thirsting. And maybe in your life tonight, there's a thirsting. You've, maybe you've never quite heard it like this before. But you've got a thirst. And you go from drink to drink. And when I say drink, don't, don't assume what I'm saying. I'm not saying from Jim Beam to Jack Daniels to... Uh, Roy Rogers. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that and the drink of sex, the drink of power, the drink of violence, the drink of control, the drink of money, the drink of you fill in the blank. All of these pursuits, why do you go after them? Why do you hunger for them? Why do you have to manipulate so that everything is pleasing now to you? It's got to be this way, and I'm going to do everything I can to have it my way. You know, listen, most often when we're unhappy, it's because we perceive things should be a different way, and that way ought to be done in such a way that makes me happy. And um, I don't know, have you, have you come to the realization in life it doesn't happen that way? And you can be searching and doing all kinds of things in pursuit, and God's the one that says, come to me. Are you thirsty? So, listen, as it were, have you been running around the world and your tongue is hanging out, you're all, you know, tired and you're not satisfied and your life is getting a, a little bruised up and beaten? God is saying to you tonight, you come to me. Don't come to Calvary Chapel. Don't go to First Baptist. Don't go to the Catholic Church. Don't go there. Don't go here. Don't go whatever. God says, come to me. None of those things can save you. Only Jesus can save you. But I love God's heart. He wants to quench your thirst and down deep inside, it's as though there's a hole in your life and nothing you've poured inside there yet. You've been with men, you've been with women, you've got power, you've got the money. You thought maybe once you had your first million, you'd be satisfied and you're, you're, now you're more aware of being empty than ever. And you're empty and God wants to fill you. Only God can fill you. Listen, Jesus said in John chapter 4 verse 10, and notice this invitation that goes out. It goes out to everybody. John chapter 4 verse 10 the Bible there says, Jesus answered and said to her, that's the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And then the woman said to him, that is Jesus, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, listen, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Water of the world. You're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I, uh, that I shall give him will become, listen, in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. Jesus is saying, go drink of all the fountains of the world and you will not have eternal life. You'll still be thirsty. But Jesus said, the water I give you, notice, immediately switches it to the woman at the well. He goes from earthly water to spiritual water. And he says, the water I give 
you'll never be thirsty again. And that equates with what I give, it is eternal life. Once you know that you have eternal life, and by the way, the Bible says, listen, don't ever, don't ever be sold a bill of goods, friends. The Bible says in 1 John, these things have been written that you might know that you have eternal life. You are to know it now. Friends, listen, if you do not know that if you die tonight, you'd go to heaven. If you don't know that for sure, then you need to make that decision tonight. You need to come to Christ tonight. Maybe you've been religious all your life and you've been all around the things of religiosity and Christianity and your dad was a pastor and your mom played the organ and your brother is a missionary, but you're outside the kingdom. You've never experienced God personally. You need to change that tonight. God would say to you, why wouldn't you come? He's extending an invitation. An external, listen, it's external, coming from Jesus. He says, I give it. But once he gives it, what does the Bible tell us? We read it a moment ago. It's inside of you. And that is not an it, it's the Spirit of God himself. It's Christ in you. And notice that you and I, friends, we have no internal source of satisfaction. You and I do not have that. I don't care who you are tonight, we'll all agree on that, no matter what uh, view you have about life. You could be an atheist this evening. We'll all agree on this. Inside of us, we do not have the power to be satisfied. That's why we reach out externally. And yet Jesus is saying tonight, the answer is actually found inside of you, but the answer has to be placed inside of you. And that is that personal relationship with God. In John chapter 7, verse 37, the Bible says, and on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood, he's at the temple, by the way, in Jerusalem, and he cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What a statement. But this, verse 39 says, he spoke concerning the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He had not yet died and been resurrected from the dead. But church, look at that verse. It says that those who believe in Christ would receive the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit in them. But maybe tonight, there's one of you that God is saying, tonight you come. And then he's also talking about when you consider this, he speaks about this satisfied eternal life. He talks about a covenant that is everlasting. I want you to write these verses down. They're truly awesome. It's our future, by the way. If we could pull out your insurance plan as a Christian, it'd have these verses on it. Book of Revelation, chapter 21, talks about the, what is known as the eternal state. It is uh, when the new Jerusalem comes down, spiritual Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, not the Jerusalem in Israel. This is different. Revelation 21, verse 6 says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. This is Jesus speaking. The beginning and the end. And I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Jesus satisfies. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say that again, and then you guys act really Pentecostal and say amen, okay? <laughs> so let's get real quiet. We'll edit, we'll edit this for radio so, so it sounds really awesome. You ready? Three, two, one. Jesus satisfies. In Revelation 21, verse 22 goes on. But I saw no temple in it. He's talking about heaven. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, that's Jesus, are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, for there is no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations, that's another word for Gentiles, into it. But there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who, listen, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name tonight written in the Lamb's book of life? 
You've got to know that. The Bible says that all names are written in the book of life, but the Bible says that all those who are not going into heaven but wind up in hell, the Bible says that those names that are in the book of life, their names are blotted out of the book of life. How do you keep your name in the book of life tonight? On the day when you die and you stand before God, how can you assure that your name stays unblotted out of the book of life? There's only one way. You've got to have your name copied, right? Take your mouse, highlight your name under or on the page of the book of life. Take your name, highlight it, hit copy, accept the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, go over to the Lamb's book of life, it's a different book, and hit paste. And on the day of judgment, when you see your name in the Lamb's book of life, your name is also appearing in the book of life, and you're safe. And you can know that now. But listen, if you never get your name copied into the Lamb's book of life, God would say, by the way, why wouldn't you come? Why didn't you copy your name and believe and trust in my son Jesus? Why didn't you do that? There'll be nobody to blame. You won't be able to blame me. I've told you the truth. You won't be able to blame your mom. You won't be able to blame the government. You won't be able to blame anybody else. You will have the opportunity, and you do now, to make that choice. You see, you keep your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and in the Book of Life by choosing Christ. But if on that day the Lamb's Book of Life is open and your name is not there, it's because when the Book of Life is opened, your name is not there any longer either. It's been blotted out. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 11, that all those whose names were not found written in the Book of Life were cast into hell. You know you've got to crawl over the body of Jesus Christ to get into hell? God is not like grease in the street and having you slip and fall into it. He's not pushing you in that direction. Jesus came and died to keep you out of hell. Why, why would you go there? And God is saying to you tonight, what are you doing? Come to me. I want to make an everlasting covenant with you. That's a deal, ladies and gentlemen. Hmm. I'm sorry, I just got done yelling at you because I'm so excited about this. This is life, my friend, and it's Jesus bought, he paid for it. It's, it's, all, for, it's all by him. See, what are you getting so excited about? Because we want you, I don't, you know what, we want you with this. You may be a little stinker, I don't know you. I, mean, I don't know all of you, I know a lot of you, I don't know all of you. But uh, you know why we want, you may, be, you, may be the, you may be a horrible person here tonight. But we want you with us. Now, that may be the best deal you get on earth. It's certainly the best deal you'd ever get in heaven. But we want you to be with us. You say, why would you want you, me to be with you guys? Because you know what? Uh, we don't know you all that well, or we don't know you at all. But God knows you. Jesus died for you. He thought you were worth it. So you know what? If, if he thinks you're worth it, then we think you're worth it. So you should come with us. Yeah. Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, Gentiles. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. Revelation twenty-two seventeen. 17. Listen to this. Right at the end of your Bible. And the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and the Bride... Wow. In the New Testament, who's the bride? The church. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirst, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. What do you pay to get into heaven? Nothing. Christ has done it all. And what is this everlasting covenant? My Jewish friends, listen to this carefully. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, this is a Hebrew prophet speaking to the Hebrew people. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. You know what covenant he's talking about? Ten Commandments. 
Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Jewish friend, the covenant that God gave with the Ten Commandments was broken. The commandments are holy, but God told Moses in the day that they break the commandments, they're going to have to offer up a lamb as a blood sacrifice. So that means there's another covenant that's got to be everlasting because the first covenant is not everlasting. Think about it. The second covenant God's talking about replaces the previous, which is old and broken. If you're Jewish tonight, listen. Your Bible, your prophets say a second covenant is necessary. And it's found in Jeremiah 31, verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And that invitation to the Jewish people is the exact same invitation to the Gentile people of the world tonight. How was the Jew saved? The same way as Gentile saved. By looking to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God saves by no other means but by the blood of his son Jesus. You can't buy your way to heaven. You cannot be good enough to get to heaven. You cannot be born into heaven. You've got to be born again to get into heaven. And Jesus does that. In Psalm 22, verse 27, the Bible says all the ends of the earth, that's Gentiles, shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations, that's Gentiles, shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. Isaiah 11, verse 10 says, for the Gentiles shall seek him. What a promise. The second thing we see tonight, why don't you come, is in verses 3 to 5, when God has said, listen, what he has said is this mercy. He says, for the sure mercies of David, indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people. Now, he's speaking about the descendant of David. Now, church, Bible students, you know, you know who the key preeminent descendant of David is? According to the flesh, exactly. The Messiah would have to come through David. To the people, a leader, a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know. And nations who do not know you, they shall run to you. Because the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Don't need to belabor that. It's simply this, that God is announcing that the Messiah would come through Israel. Now, you may be here tonight. You don't believe any of this stuff. But let me ask you, is there a rumor going around for the last 2,000 years? that there was a Jew crucified in Jerusalem at the hands of the Roman Empire, rejected by the Jewish religious leadership? And is there, is there a rumor going around that three days later there was an empty tomb in Jerusalem? That millions or hundreds of millions of people in the, in the, in the last two millennia have died for their faith in this one? He's the son of David, according to the flesh. God's the one who says, return to me. Look at verses 6 and 7. He says, return to me. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Anybody recognize this old song? We used to sing it at Calvary. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him, that is the wicked and the unrighteous, return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Oh, my goodness. Amen. Excuse me, hello. Are you... <laughs> I don't read the Old Testament. It scares me. The God of the Old Testament is not the same God as the New Testament. Oh, yeah, he is. <laughs> There's one God, and he wrote both of those testaments. And you ought to look right there at verses 6 and 7, especially verse 7. And you ought to get like a little happy dance in your feet. Remember what I was saying earlier? Are you the most notorious person around? Then cheer up. Are you a scandalous person? Are you a sinner? Oh, wait, are, what does it say? Are you a wicked person and an unrighteous person? <gasps> How dare you say that? Well, I'm not done talking yet. He's, God says, I want the wicked and the unrighteous person to come to me. 
He says, I want to abundantly pardon you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm trying to compose myself up here right now because I know me. And I know what I once was. And when I read that, I can, I can tell you right now, he is faithful to pardon the wicked and the unrighteous. He pardons. God is amazing. The only reason why you would not rejoice over that is because you are so impressed with yourself that you don't need him. So you think. But for those of us who are wretches, this is good news. And this is as gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as you can get. And we're reading a 3,000-year-old prophecy. And God says to the world, I want to pardon you. Will you let God pardon you? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And it all begins with him saying, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty inside? Are you thirsty? Are you satisfied on the inside? Jesus satisfies us, what he does. And what's amazing about what he says, you know, we don't have the time to go over to this portion, but I'll just paraphrase it. When Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. If you eat the bread, if you eat this bread, you'll never be hungry again. So what does that mean? It means if you eat the truth of Jesus, you, you take, you, you don't, listen, you don't do what the Bible warns us about in Hebrews 6 where you, you taste. You know, the Bible says that there's those who are in and out of church. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4, 5, and 6. There are people that go in and out of church, and it says that they taste of the things of God. Can you imagine? They, they take truth, they put it in their mouth, roll it around a little bit, get a taste, and over time they spit it out. And then it says in Hebrews 6, verses 4, 5, and 6, that they drink or they partake of the things of the Spirit. It means they sip. They hang out with Christians just enough to feel like maybe I'm part of the group, I don't know, whatever. And they just know they're not in it all the way. They were, they're not born again, but they're not unbelievers. Their belief was never enough to bring them to faith. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, these are they who believe for a while. But when persecution comes or hardship, they give up. They were never saved. They just hung out in church. It happens all the time. It's in, look, Jesus, how many people? Jesus was a pastor of a church of 12 people. One of them was possessed by the devil. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Can you say tonight that you're sat? Listen, you're either satisfied or you're thirsty tonight. The Christian who knows the Lord Jesus Christ personally is satisfied. Amen. We ate of his truth. We're done looking for truth. <laughs> done. Satisfied. And we drank of the Spirit. We're not thirsty anymore. We're not on some quest, some religious pursuit. We're done. You know, you like, it's like eating a gigantic steak and potato meal or something, you know? You're just like, I don't want it anymore. You're full. Christians are full. We're full. We're satisfied. We're not searching anymore. And that's pretty cool, you know, because when the world says, hey, hey, but how about this? And the world comes tempting. It's like, well, um, I'm full. There's no room for that. What about him? What about her? What about that? Ugh, whew. There was a time I would have gone for that, but I'm stuffed. Oh, got Jesus coming out of my ears. You got you to gotta agree. Listen, man, people who are just religious, they're just religious. They're still vacant on the inside. 
That's why they have a hard time. They run around, they go to, they're sinning up a storm, trying to find meaning and fulfillment and be satisfied. And then they, they feel horrible. Then they got to run back to confession and try to get that off of them. And, because, and they're not full. They're still empty. And then they go back out and then they get tempted and pulled away. They're trying to fill the hole. And then, so they sin again. And then they go back to confession. Right? The reason why they're in that horrible cycle is because they're not satisfied. Are you thirsty? You know what? Um, I've completely botched up this whole, I've got notes and it's not working. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask, if Gia's listening to me right now, if she could come back out. <laughs> we need to sing, listen, I'm going to ask you to stand. Maybe we can dim the lights, you guys. Okay, so here's the deal. This is not a show. This is not a game. This is, this is, this is between you and God. But tonight, as she sings this song, will you, will you please know that you're safe here tonight? You're safe. And maybe tonight the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and he's saying, you know, you're not sure. You are not sure, you know. That if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. The thought of it terrifies you. You're not, you're not satisfied. You're not secure. Tonight, while we sing this song, we're going to dim the lights. I'm going to ask you tonight to make a commitment to Jesus Christ, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ tonight in a public way. And now, it doesn't mean I'm going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you by name. You don't have to say anything like that. Or, but if you're going to accept Christ tonight and, and have it set in, in God's book now forever, Amen. it means this tonight that you would agree with what you've heard tonight in just this brief time. We've only been talking for like 30, 35 minutes, but maybe it was enough for you to understand, you know what, Pastor, I, I'll agree with you about yourself and me too. I'm a wretch and I'm, un, and I'm unrighteous. I, I need God. I need a change in my life. It hasn't gone well. I'm tired. Life is terrifying. I'm a sinner. I've done bad things. I've thought bad things. I need salvation. I don't want to live my life anymore. I want God to live his life through me, okay? If that appeals to you, and I know it does to the person that's thirsty, but you need to be strong enough tonight to take a public stand for Jesus, okay? And that just means simply coming up and standing at the foot of this stage. Come, just come and stand up here as we sing this song tonight, and we'll just sing it. Just lead us in worship. Because those of us who know this song, we're going to love it. We're going to sing it. But if God speaks to you tonight and he says something like, you should go up there. Do not get in a debate with yourself. <laughs> Obey him. Yes. I won't scare you. I won't hurt. I won't even talk to you. <laughs> you just come. So let's worship. If God speaks to you, obey him and live. Simple as that. Maybe you're, maybe you're sitting out there still tonight and you're, you know, there's, there's a thought in your head. You're wondering, what will my husband think? What will my wife think? Or what will my boyfriend think? What will my girlfriend think? What will my parents think? Did you know Jesus said, I have come to set a mother against her son and a father against his daughter. Isn't that a radical statement? You say, what in the world? Yeah, when you read that portion of scripture, Jesus is introducing the family of God. And in a family, there's unity. And when the Holy Spirit is working in someone's life to invite you into the family of God, you know, it sometimes it separates earthly families. I mean, I have to confess to you guys, maybe you're the same way, but, but you guys are much more my family than earthly fa family. I mean, there's nothing better than to have earthly family that's spiritual family. That's awesome. But when you have unbelieving family members and then you come to the family of Christ, if blood is thicker than water, then the spirit's thicker than blood. Okay, so maybe tonight you're thinking, well, you know, I don't know. You need to trust God. And the other thing is this. There may be somebody still here tonight that you just think you're just too bad to be forgiven. You think somehow, some way that you've got to 
do penance somehow. You have to cut yourself. Maybe you have to beat yourself. Maybe somehow you've got some, you think that if you somehow scourge yourself, then maybe God will accept you. I want you to know that's, that's a very tragic way of thinking. And yet it's very common. When we're hurt and scarred and we don't have hope, did you know that we turn around and we actually physically hurt and scar ourselves? It's part of the fall. Jesus wants to deliver you tonight from self-abuse. Your body belongs to him if you'll give it to him tonight. He wants to heal you and set you free. It's what he does. You may be here tonight and you've been saying, good for those people, good for them. That's so good. What about you? Wouldn't it be horrible to miss heaven by 18 inches? The distance from your head to your heart. Don't get bogged down with religion. Jesus said he's got to come inside and if he does, out of the innermost part of you will flow rivers of living water. Every child of God knows this. Please, friend, please, if you don't know this, make the commitment tonight. You can be an usher here tonight. You can be a a regular attendee tonight and maybe God is speaking to you tonight and you're saying, you know what? I'm going to seal the deal tonight. I'm going to make sure. I'm going to make that commitment. I'm going to go public with Jesus. Listen, serving Jesus is not going public as it is confessing Christ. He didn't ask us to serve him. He asked us to confess him. So we're going to sing either that song or whatever song Gia wants to sing, but one last call before this ship sails. Are you going to get on board? Don't let God, with a broken heart, shout from the ship, why wouldn't you come? Don't let your life end and God in eternity say, why didn't you make that decision that night? You were so close and you didn't do it. Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you come? Tonight's the night. Today's the day of salvation for you. Now's the acceptable time. Today's the day. But let's, the rest of us, keep our focus on the one who saves, okay? Let's do that right now together. Those of you who are here now up front, do something a little bit different than the norm tonight. You've come forward. And I want you to know, we want you to know, that by coming forward, you're acknowledging Jesus. You were told earlier that you need him to wash you of your sins. You know what those sins are, and so does he. No one else needs to know that. It's between you, it's between you and him alone, right where you're at tonight. And Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my father. And so you've come forward tonight. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. And so you're you're not guilty of that. You have come. You're at this altar tonight. Not only does God see this, we see this. The angels of God see this. And right where you're at tonight, in your own words, you can ask God, number one, you can ask God right now, to receive you in the name of Jesus. You can ask him tonight to forgive you of your sins. And you can thank him tonight because that's possible because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how God forgives 
thank him for that right now. And while you're thanking him, tell him right now that you are opening wide the door of your heart to invite him into your life. And by so doing, you are proclaiming him to be your Lord and Savior. Friends, listen. This decision you're making, nowhere in the Bible does it speak of feelings. You may have feelings. That's fine. You may not have any feelings tonight. That's fine. It's by faith. Faith transcends feelings. This world only lives by feelings. Life is truly by faith. To those who are unbelieving, they don't understand that. They can't. Tonight, those of you who have come forward, you're willing. You've, came, you've come forward by faith. You believe God has touched your heart tonight. You believe he's hearing you tonight. And in this moment, and this goes for all of us in this room and those watching right now as well, if you're struggling and battling with this emotional thing about Will God accept me? Or maybe I'm maybe He doesn't want me anymore. Listen, as long as long as you want Christ in your life, it's because He wanted you first. Do you understand that? If you're struggling tonight out there in the audience or, or you're watching right now and you're all messed up about the insecurity of your salvation and, and maybe you're not a Christian anymore because you listen, those who do not want Jesus, they do not want Jesus. Stop letting your feelings ravage you. Do you want Christ? That's because God put that in your heart. Rejoice in that. Thank God he never said, now go by your feelings and obey them. Hallelujah. He said, thus saith the Lord. He said, you come to me and I'll never turn you away. He said, if you're dead in your sins, he'll make you alive. He said, you must be born again a second time to enter the kingdom of heaven. So friends up here right now, pray this prayer if you would and mean it. Dear Jesus, forgive me. Wash me of my sins. I give you my sins. And I receive your righteousness. And I thank you, Jesus, for being my Lord and my Savior. I proclaim today that I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.